Good evening. I call this meeting of the Board of Directors for Dr. Cog. Hello. Call this meeting of the Dr. Dr. Cog Board of Directors to order. To order. There we go. Uh, for Wednesday, June 21st, 2023. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Please, if you're able, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, we did. <laughs> oh, you're sitting in an illegal seat. <clears throat> Thank you very much. With that, we will go to the roll call and the introduction of any new members and alternates. Uh, by the way, if you uh, park downstairs and haven't already grabbed it before you leave, be sure to see Ms. Stevens for the parking voucher. Roll call. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, Sitting County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. <clears throat> Nicholas Williams, Sitting City and County of Denver. Here. Kevin Flynn, City County of Denver. Right next to you. There you go. George Teal, Douglas <laughs> County. <laughs> Across from you. <laughs> Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Here. Tracy Craft Art, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahlkemper, Jefferson County. Lisa Ferre, City of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer, City of Arvada. Here. Hey. Dustin Bonick. Hey. I got the bar in the back. It's open. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Dustin Zvonek, a City of Aurora. Juan Marcano, City of Aurora. Larry Vidim, Town of Bennett. Roy Spindell, Bennett. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Here. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Mike Sutherland, Centennial. Here. <clears throat> Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. John Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Lisa Jones, Foxfield. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. <clears throat> Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Tuscher, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Sure. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Sure. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. <clears throat> Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Winshaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Tim Long, North Glen. <clears throat> John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Here. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Ud Starker, Wee Ridge. Present. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Here. All right. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start asking for a motion to approve the agenda. I would move that we approve the agenda. Thank you very Second. much. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Great. Uh, thank you. We have an agenda. Report of the chair. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know the reason we cheered when Bob Pfeiffer was uh, the former chair of Dr. Cog, who we haven't seen for a while, and it's the alternate part of us, so welcome back.
Uh, a couple of things from me, report to the chair, before we have the uh, some of the other things. I uh, wanted to mention a couple of things that I did related to Dr. Cog since our last meeting. On May 30th, I spoke at the Civic Academy, their final class session. Uh, I want to thank staff for all their work with that, that absolute great program. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was fun to be there and see some of the final presentations and appreciate the chance to be there. And then on June 11th, I was on No Copay Radio. Uh, which is the, the program in KOSI that uh, our uh, area agency on aging does. And that was fun to do that 15-minute interview. So that was a, a great time. Uh, for those of you that were at the workshop, you, you, uh, the, the banquet, you may have heard my radio presentation. In case you didn't get enough or in case you missed it, on Thursday, July 13th, I will be doing a presentation in Edgewater specifically about all of the Edgewater radio stations, uh, KFXJ, KIMN, KYGO. Uh, so if you're bored that night, we would love to see you 630 at the Civic Center. No laughter, please. I'll be there. Now we get a little more official. Uh, uh, this is uh, information on an upcoming public hearing. The Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, has scheduled a public hearing for July 19th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. to receive comments on the draft fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program and Associated Air Quality Conformity Determinations. Further information about this public hearing is available on the Dr. Cog website, including the draft documents and how to provide comment no later than July 19th. With that, I will ask for a report on the Performance and Engagement Committee. Commissioner Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a great discussion tonight. The meeting happened right before this meeting and before <clears throat> the Finance and Budget Committee. We had a great discussion about um, nominations to receive the John V. Christensen Award and nominees to receive Distinguished Service Awards, and we did give direction on that. We had one informational item, continued discussion on meeting participation options, virtual, in-person, and we've asked staff to make some um, edit changes to a, um, a proposal that we'll bring to the board next time. That concludes my report. Very much. And a uh, report on the Finance and Budget Committee from Director Whitlow, Mayor Whitlow. Thank, thank you, Chair. We had one action item tonight, and we passed a uh, resolution authorizing our Executive Director to extend a project completion date for contract with Gravity Works to the end of the year. And we also had an informa informational item on Human Services, the transportation tip set aside in Federal Transit Administration for funding. Sir, that completes our nine-minute meeting. Thank you very much, sir. It was a record-setting meeting. That was, that was impressive. Uh, Mr. Executive Director, your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, three items for you this evening. The first is on Bike to Work Day. A Bike to Work Day is actually just around the corner a week from today. Um, it is our Dr. Cog's largest event. We're expecting 30, 35,000 people participate in this event. And if you ordered um, apparel from us, free apparel from us, T-shirts, hats should be sent out to you tomorrow. So hopefully you'll get those in time for the event and hopefully you'll wear, wear those proudly um, as, you're, as you're around your jurisdiction. Um, if, uh, you know, we would encourage you to participate wherever you can. We have a bunch of breakfast stations. There's hundreds throughout the region. If you could, you know, uh, you know kind of have a look and see where those are. There's a map on our, on our uh, website. It's on, uh, what is that website name? Uh, there it is, biketoworkday.co. Thank you, Steve, very much. Award celebration. Director um, Baker mentioned uh, that the, the Forms and Engagement Committee has made some recommendations on the John V. Christensen Award, as well as Distinguished Service Awards at their meeting just held recently. Um, so the actual event will be held on October 4th at the Sewell Ballroom. And um, so we're, you know, obviously our team's hard at work in, in getting, getting that all together is a big deal, as you can imagine. Um, and, and we're expecting it to be as, as good as it always is. And we really want to, uh, you know, we really would appreciate if you all would help us in sponsorship opportunities. If you have any leads with your sponsorship, please just pick up the phone and give me a call or send me a text or something. We'll, we'll follow through with that. But uh, as you can imagine, it's, we try to do this on sponsor, sponsorship dollars, and 
Um, you know, we're expecting to have to raise probably seventy, eighty thousand this year in order to do this. So if you have any any leads, please let us know. Last but not least on the regional housing strategy, um, we've had several conversations with you all uh, here recently, most notably at the board retreat a couple, three weeks ago, a month ago, uh, as well as um, at the board work session earlier this month. Um, we are, you know, we're starting to do some of the groundwork right now in order to prepare and get ready for some additional consulting services to perform that work. Um, we are anticipating bringing an item to you all next month uh, for to approve a unified planning work program uh, 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 revision that will allow us to use um, federal monies to do at least a phase of, of that re of that strategy that will get us through the end of the year. And which, just to refresh your memories and those that are newer in the room, um, we, uh, we hope as part of this process that by the end of this year, early in the session, that we have enough information available that we can share and, quite frankly, kind of change the conversation with the legislature about how they can help uh, local governments in, in um, this housing crisis that we have. So um, we're excited about this opportunity, and uh, just, that's just a quick update of where we are. But we're going to be moving really quickly, quickly, assuming we get board approval next month. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my – I will say this is the last time that we'll see each other before the 4th. Um, actually, we are canceling the board work session July 5th. So just FYI to that, I know you're all devastated. Um, so please have a very joyous celebration on the 4th and be safe. We'll see you soon. Very much. Uh, I wanna amplify the, the talk about the awards briefly and the sponsorships. If your municipalities have the ability to sponsor, that's awesome. If you know businesses that, that have an interest in, in sponsoring, you know, those are just absolutely huge. So I uh, would absolutely encourage you to, to think about that. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you have like a sponsorship packet that you could share with us that we can um, help circulate. Yes, thank you very much for that question. And I was remiss in mentioning that. We will be sending out a packet to the board directors next week. Um, that will hopefully serve that purpose. I definitely encourage that. And then uh, very much encourage you to put October 4th on your calendar. Uh, there will not be a work session that night. That's normally a work session night. And instead, there will be the, the awards, which is really one of our, our key events. And at least historically, board directors are complimentary in attending that. They will. And plus one. <laughs> and plus one. So we we'll just really encourage you to, to make that a part of your planning for uh, uh, the upcoming months. So thank you very much. Uh, we will move into public comment. We have up to 45 minutes allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have any public comment? Well, there you go. Uh, we will move ahead to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes the summary of the May 17th, 2023 meeting, and also the fiscal year 2022-2025 transportation improvement plan tip amendments as seen in your packet? I move, Chair. Second. Do you have something else, uh, Mr. Thiel, that I don't want to? If it pleased the board, I was going to make a motion. And we already got that. So you were so polite. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Any, any discussion? Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstention. Thank you very much. With that, we will move ahead to our action item, which is, is a discussion on the development of a comprehensive economic development strategy, or CEDS. Uh, Flo Rotano, Director of Partnership Development and Innovation, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will apologize to those of you who were at the board work session. This is going to be a little bit of a repeat of material, but hopefully it's a little fresh. And tonight you're getting the Cliff Notes version of that. But I um, did want to, to provide some background on, on um, the, uh, the, the SEDS process that we're 
we're um, talk about to talk about here. So this is the timeline, and you can see that this is a uh, very aggressive timeline. Um, we are proposing to have the SEDs essentially written by the end of this year so that when we get into the new year, we can have a, a true celebration of it. Um, and, and, and we're doing that to make sure that we're good partners with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, who is working to write a statewide set and actually have asked us to, to uh, undertake this, this venture. It does have advantages to us, um, and, 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 and I'll explain that in, in a little bit, but um, this, this is a pretty aggressive uh, timeline if you, if you look at it. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's in a SEDS. And, and it really is an exercise in engagement with both the governance team and the stakeholders. And, and, and those two groups will play very different roles in, in, in the process. The summary background is really a, a snapshot in time of where the region's economy currently is. And that, that includes things, things like, you know, what are the economic drivers and, and uh, what, what are the primary industry clusters? demographics, and, and, and it's all about the data. And that's why on the timeline, you saw that the data intelligence gathering occurs pretty early in, 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 in the process. Um, the SWOT analysis and the strategic action plan um, is where the stakeholders become very important in the, in the process and the conversation. And that evaluation framework is largely developed by the governance team, the leadership team um, for the this, SEDS this process. And, and, and that evaluation framework is important because it's how we measure success going forward. How, to know, how do we know that, that this document and the exercise that we un undertake is, having, is making a difference? So that, that's a very important element of it. Well, this is just a, a brief summary of, of uh, what the various sections are, are all about. And for the most part, they're pretty straightforward. There is this new thing called economic resilience, and, and, and really what that is all about, it's, it's the ability to recover quickly from a shock, the ability to withstand the shock, and the ability to avoid a shock altogether, and, and that's all bundled under something called economic resist, resilience, which is a relatively new concept by the, by the EDA, and that includes both a steady state and a responsive um, resilience initiatives. And, and so an example of a steady state economic resilience initiative would be something like economic diversification, because that's intended to, to avoid a shock to, to the system, a shock to the economy, whereas the, the um, responsive initiative would be something more like something you put in place to, to uh, address uh, the rapid recovery of it. And Largely technology, it might be broadband, it could be smart grid, microgrid technology, those, those types of things. So that's, that's what the economic resilience is, is all about. Well, as you can imagine, a SEDS actually gets ultimately approved by the Economic Development Administration, part of the Department of Commerce at, at, at the U.S. level. And, and it comes with their priorities, and these are their seven priorities. And, and they ask that the SEDS examine all seven. Now, the SEDS doesn't have to include all seven with great detail and a lot of initiatives and a lot of, lot of objectives uh, to, to address them, but they do want the process to at least look at, at each of them. Um, there are, of course, certain elements that we know that the EDA has as an emphasis, and, and those are equity, workforce development, and recovery and resilience. So those really need to be fully fleshed out in, 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 in our, our SEDS for, for the Dr. Cog region. Okay, I mentioned governance and, and, and a strategy team and leadership team. Those are all the same terms that EDA uses interchangeably for the responsible adults in the room. Um, and it's an important group of people, right? Um, because that leadership really is charged with the overall development of the SEDS, as well as helping identify that evaluation framework. So they have a really important job to play, and it's, 
it's really involvement from start to finish. And, and now this list is illustrative. It's not inclusive. And, and um, as, as you can anticipate, the EDA also says who they want at the table, right? So we have to kind of incorporate those rules as well. But the, um, this body will actually shape the SEDs, really work with the final draft of the SEDs in preparation of returning that final draft to this body. It will be the Dr. Cog Board of Directors that approves the final document for, for the SEDs. And, and um, so that's kind of an important role as well. So what we'd like, ideally, is for three or four of you to kind of step to the fore tonight to volunteer to be on the leadership team. Um, and, and, and ideally, that will give us some geographic coverage as well as size of municipality coverage or county coverage. So, um, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to, point to people, but you know who you are that we would like to have work with us if you're willing to work. You've got to put up with me for six months, basically, what that means. Okay. <gasps> so, stakeholders, that's a different group. They have a very defined role to play in the SWOT analysis and, and then identifying the strategic plan elements as well. So those are two really key roles. And that leadership team will also help work with, with us to identify potential stakeholders. And, and, and of course, yes, the EDA does have people that they would like on this. And, and you know, as a, for instance, we know that the, the EDA really has a focus on, on exports and direct foreign investment. Well, we've got the World Trade Center here, so it would kind of be logical to invite them to be a stakeholder. So, you know, that we, we kind of have an idea of who we have to go after, but it's not inclusive and exhaustive yet. Okay, so what we are asking you to do this evening is, is to approve the development of a comprehensive economic development strategy, a SEDS, for the Dr. Cog region by Dr. Cog staff. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Flo. This was really helpful, and, and I was at the work session, so a good reinforcement of, of that information. I do wonder, though, when I talked to my economic development team in the city that I represent, they had this was not known to them. So I just want to make sure that, like, um, that's coming next. I, it wasn't clear from that list of stakeholders, like, will we be working with the municipalities who have, and I know that all of us have different um, sort of strengths and, and considerations in that space, but want to make sure that that's also a possibility. Right. And, and you know, we have been meeting with Metro Denver EDC, which actually has, I think it's every two months that their group of economic development professionals throughout the entire region meets. And, and, and we've met with them. There's a, a strong uh, indication of interest. And, and I also had coffee last week with, with the CEO of uh, Jeffco's EDC, the, the Big Jeffco EDC, and and um, you know he was he was interesting because he he came from the south, and 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 he goes honestly he said I don't know why we don't already have one of those here but you, you know I'm in, so um, yes there is a role particularly for our local economic development development professionals to play, and and at some point it might be on the leadership team at some point it's more likely on the stakeholder team to help us identify what we need to be paying attention to. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, thank you for the question. Yeah, Flo kind of answered there at the end. I think, yes, it's obvious. We, what, we're building a database right now of those local, locally, local economic development professionals to, um, to include on our list, whether that be on the governing body or the stakeholder list. That'll make we'll make that determination at some some later date. But and Flo's right. I mean, we we've really utilized and we will continue to utilize Metro Denver EDC because of the relationships they have. I, we knew. Go, listen, this is non traditional work for us. Um, and I, it was actually it, it came to pass. I was at a National Association of Regional Councils. They have an executive directors meeting every year. And it was during COVID, and we broke up into two groups, and one group was the auto transportation policy or something. I went to that group, and then the other group was economic development, and a lot of them are economic, de 
economic development districts. Economic development districts. And, um, and I was curious in that group because they were talking about money, right? And we were talking about policy. But it was it, what it turns out was that, you know, in order to be eligible for that federal EDA money, as well as some other grant opportunities, you have to have a SEDS. And there's only certain uh, agencies that can do that. You have to be a public sector agency to do that. So we realized that there was going to be some anxiousness about what what's Dr. Cog doing now, right? And I think through the Metro Denver EDC, we've been able to you know at least provide some comfort and other conversations we've had with the economic development professionals that what we're doing, what we do well is we facilitate, right? We're not we don't want to get in anybody's kitchen. You all do all that economic development stuff. What we're trying to do is get you to the table, come up with a strategic plan. And I think they, they understand the distinction. So um, this time last year, I wouldn't say that, uh, I wouldn't feel as comfortable about it as what I do now. So, but, but we will, we'll be reaching out to all, all the local, locally affected uh, and, and professionals. And well, we know that the COVID-19 uh, timeout uh, expires at the end of this year because this region actually has benefited from EDA funding throughout the COVID period, but that ends with the start of the new year. So for us to be able, for our communities, not us, not Dr. Cog, but for our communities to be able to access EDA funding for projects um, going forward, we, we have to have an approved SEDS in place. And it's the SEDS actually that get, is the golden ticket, right? The EDD designation, you know, it doesn't matter, but it's it's the SEDS that is the, the controlling document. Thank you. Of this, that we already picked the that you're hoping. Um, we're open to suggestions. You can email flow. So. Yeah, so, so listen, so the board has a very specific role, like you ultimately will approve the sets, yes. right? Um, but also it, part of the governing structure, we would like to, if there were some volunteers to step up to serve on the governing committee, we would welcome that as well. You don't have to shout it out tonight if you don't want to, um, but it sounds like Director Sangren is definitely interested. No, and shouting, so is, that's great. But if you are interested, we'd, you know, we'd be, you know, just shoot myself or flow an email. Mr. Yeah. Pfeiffer, have we said welcome back yet? Yeah, you have. Actually, this is, um, you know, I'm late to this party, but uh, I think this is great, this direction. And if this is new to the elements of what we're doing, I think it, 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 the fabric of transportation and economic development go together. I mean, customers go to our businesses. How do you think they get there? How to get commerce there? It makes sense. We should have been here a lot longer, you know, maybe when he was chair or he was chair, <laughs> but not when I was chair. But this is more in, in tune than elevator inspections or anything else we did in the past. So if anyone has been around a while, I think this fits more in the fabric of it. So I, I applaud uh, the, I don't know who came up with this idea, if it was staff or this group. Oh, it's Doug fault. Okay. It's Doug fault. We'll wait for the results, but it, this is great. I mean, this is something that we should be doing. I, 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 I'm supportive of it. I'm looks like we're doing an action on this, but uh, I just wanted to share some comments being at fresh eyes in here. I think this is awesome. And, this, this better aligns with Dr. Cog and, and the region. And yeah, we have all economic development groups, and I'm, I know Dr. Cog will engage our teams and, and get us where we need to get to. Um, it's a big world out there in the economic development world, so and we're all fighting over, you know, having those tax dollars in our communities. But you'll you'll tread lightly through this, and, and we'll get to a happy place. So I'm fully supportive of this. Thank you. No questions or comments? I don't think. I Well, heck, I like hanging out with Jan and, and Jessica, so um, I'll volunteer too. Um, but, you know, I think just as a comment, uh, I think it's important to remember, uh, you know, um, here in Colorado and Denver very specifically, we used to be known, much like the rest of the Mountain West, for boom and bust economies. And if anybody here grew up here and you remember the 80s, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you the story of uh, being uh, um, the lower middle class, but still kind of middle class kid in Greeley, Colorado in the 1980s, 
was uh, was not a time high on the hog. You know, those were tough economic times, and that's what I learned uh, in a class at the good old University of Northern Colorado was the essential nature of the economy in Colorado and in the West. Now, we look at what happened in uh, 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 2002, the recession then, how we fared during the Great Recession. Um, we're probably getting to a point where we do have an inherent resilience that does take us through the, that boom and bust cycle that used to define us. I see this as a step that will help to more normalize what used to be that used to be that boom and bust economy. So I think it's great. I think um, it is a step in the right direction. I I am sure uh, you know uh, we had a conversation earlier today about how Dr. Cog has has changed and evolved since uh, Bob when you me John and um, and, and Steve we're all the newbies. And it's a very different organization, so I think uh, I think it's a great move. And if uh, it does please the board, um, it sounds like I had I do have a motion well, to approve go. development of a comprehensive economic development strategy, ES, for the Dr. Cog region by Dr. Cog staff. We have a second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we vote? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The opposed nay. And any abstentions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We appreciate that. Moving ahead to informational briefings. Uh, first of all, we will have the RTD Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, and I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieger. Uh, tra manager Transportation Planning and Operations to introduce our guest speaker. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I have the hardest job of the evening. Um, but we did want to give you an update on the RTD uh, Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. Um, RTD and stakeholders have been working on this project for about a year now. Um, they've had some initial milestones. We thought this was kind of a good uh, time frame to update all of you um, on the progress so far in the study and what to look forward to as the study enters its next phase. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Stanley, who's the project manager with RTD. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Chair, who's not here, and uh, Director, th yeah, <laughs> Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, provide an update uh, with you today. It feels like just yesterday that I was here. Um, for those that don't know, inside joke, I was here just yesterday, so. Um, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we do want to provide a, an update on where we are in the Northwest Rail. Um, obviously, this is a study that RTD has been working on, uh, or kind of a, a project, I guess, that RTD has been working on for quite some time. Um, so without further ado, I'll jump into it here. I um, wanted to start really back at the beginning and overview of what the Northwest Rail is. Um, so Northwest Rail was passed in 2004 as part of the uh, Fast Tracks uh, vote. Um, it is a 42-mile corridor that runs between Denver Union Station and Longmont. Uh, the first six miles of that corridor was completed as part of the B-Line in 2016. That runs between Denver Union Station and uh, the existing Westminster station, which is at 72nd and Lowell. Um, that particular section of, of rail runs on RTD dedicated track, and it's an overhead electrified um, electric vehicle corridor, uh, runs our current commuter rail uh, vehicle fleet. Uh, the, the remaining 35 miles uh, would run on the BNSF freight tracks, which is unique to RTD. We don't have any other rail uh, in our system that actually runs on freight tracks. Um, so, in, uh, um, so right now what we're looking at is a peak service option. I'll give you a little bit more, a few more details in just a second. Uh, but again, touch on the history. 2004 is passed as part of Fast Tracks. 2010, we completed the uh, env environmental evaluation, the EE. Uh, in the EE, there was uh, uh, identified 55 round trips uh, per day, uh, 11 new stations uh, for that particular corridor, and 
due to a lack of dedicated funding source at that point, we weren't able to implement it at that particular time. Um, but the, can, the effort continued. Uh, so in 2013, we uh, did the uh, North, Northwest Area Mobility Study, or NAMS. Um, and that particular study looked at implementing really a full service, but by geographic segment. Um, after following that study, it was agreed uh, with RTD and the stakeholders that um, the Northwest Rail was looked at really as more of a long-term project uh, with RTD committing to continued exploration and continued update, periodic updates on, on the status. Uh, 2016, I mentioned the beeline open. Uh, and then 2017 is really when the peak service concept started, started coming to fruition. So peak service is three, uh, the, the concept is three morning weekday trips from Longmont to Denver, and then three uh, weekday evening trips back from Denver to Longmont. Uh, we're partnering with our local stakeholders and jurisdictions to plan six new stations. Uh, we're also identifying uh, feasible locations for a commuter rail maintenance facility um, up in the city of Longmont. And uh, part of that is we don't have, the, the fleet that we will be getting for the Northwest Rail would be different than our existing commuter rail fleet. So we would need a different facility to, to maintain a different fleet. Uh, we're coordinating with the BNSF. Obviously, they're the owner of the corridor, so they're... Uh, pretty major player in, in what we decide to do and, and uh, how we operate on the line. Uh, evaluating potential train technologies. Um, I do want to state that the study, it's not part of the study to determine exactly what vehicle we would get. Uh, what we're doing is we're evaluating the different technologies that are there, looking at the market, um, identifying what type of vehicles are available that actually meet our operational requirements. We're, I would, to expand on that just a little bit, the only technology that we're really not looking at is an overhead electrified uh, with the OCS wires above, and that's, that's really due to the fact that we have some clearance issues. The BNSF requires a certain height above the rail, and we have some clearance issues with some of the, uh, the structures uh, along the corridor. Uh, we're uh, continue to explore uh, opportunities with partners. And, you know, one of the significant ones, obviously, that we're talking about here, which I'm sure most people are familiar with is the front range passenger rail. So I mentioned we got six new stations uh, moving from the south to the north. Uh, those stations are downtown Westminster, which is near 88th, uh, Broomfield 116th, the Flatiron Station, uh, which is where one of our, uh, and actually Broom, the both Broomfield stations are near one of the US 36 uh, stops, downtown Louisville, Boulder Junction at Depot Square, and then downtown Longmont. So while RTD is, you know, we're leading the effort, but we're certainly not doing this alone. I want to recognize that we have um, a lot of stakeholders in the area. Um, the, the, the folks that you see here, the organizations that you see here on this slide make up our study advisory team, our SAT. Uh, they provide guidance and feedback to our study throughout, uh, throughout this entire um, study and, uh, you know, really appreciate the effort. They've been giving us some good advice and keeping us on track. We appreciate that. Um, but, you know, to collectively what we, the aim is to really, really create a, uh, a reliable and connected, uh, safe network up in the Northwest area. So peak service, you know, why, why is it potentially a benefit? Uh, so given that we have limited resources, um, it will allow us to potentially provide a Northwest rail um, concept up uh, in, in the Northwest area sooner rather than later. Uh, it's a more cost-effective approach. Uh, we can uh, begin initial train service while we continue to plan and and uh, look for funding for full service. Uh, it accomplishes a lot of track and safety upgrades, things like the positive train control or the PTC, which I'm probably are familiar if you follow the news from the A-line. Um, and, uh, you know, just track safety upgrades in general. The running a freight is different than running a commuter rail. Uh, peak service is a concept that's worked out in other, um, other cities, other communities, uh, to really provide a an initial starter service, and then that can that expand as ridership demand grows. And then uh, at, we can address some of the ridership uh, needs of today while, again, planning for future expansion uh, in the future. So there is no start date identified right now for the Northwest Rail. Uh, right now, this is a feasibility study. What we're looking to try to identify is what type of infrastructure and what is needed to operate on the BNSF tracks, um, and what, what would it take to run a peak service along the corridor. Uh, we're trying to identify what we refer to as a common set of facts, and that's, you know, how much does it cost? What are the operational costs? What are the construction costs, capital costs, um, lease costs, uh, potentially with the BNSF? 
Uh, what are what are what does our ridership look like? What are the benefits, impacts, uh, and what kind of strategic partnerships can we can we look at uh, for a uh, peak service uh, concept? Uh, of course, during this whole piece, also we're we're trying to identify what type of potential funding sources are available to uh, move the needle. So the study schedule, I, I'll uh, go through this and I'll give a little caveat here at the end for everybody. But um, this this what you see here shows really kind of a conclusion of our consultant team towards the fall later on this year. We've always anticipated that really RTD would probably continue a little bit in the next year before we kind of finalize the actual report. Um, peak service uh, milestones one is a five milestone process. Milestones one and two are really fact finding. Uh, so what what is peak service? What what has happened out in the community since 2010? Um, you know we have plenty of sites that used to be blank or open sites that uh, we had a park and ride plan for that now have a six story building on it. So, you know, we need to identify what, is, what are the current conditions in the community today? What do we need to plan for? And what, how does that impact uh, what we want to do for peak service? Um, right now we're in, the, in milestone three, really towards the tail end of milestone three, which is identifying what we call the base configuration, which is really, you know, what does it take? What is the infrastructure? needed for the peak service as it was passed by our board, which is the three trips, the six stations, um, you know, the, the, their sightings associated with the BNSF, uh, where they, they will basically pull over onto a siding track. There's actually four that they've identified, and that provides RTD a, uh, the priority operation during the day, so we won't be stuck behind a freight train or, or uh, have any conflicts. Um, and then from there, milestones four and five, uh, that's really start looking at potential service options, uh, potential partnerships that we might have, and, uh, you know, what, what kind of options and strategies and next steps, uh, you know, can we, can we move forward with. The one caveat I wanted to say a little bit is that it took us a little bit longer to get the BNSF agreement in place than what we were hoping to do. Um, so that, that time schedule for the BNSF runs out a little bit longer than what's shown on this chart. So right now, our team, along with our Consultant team and our stakeholders are evaluating our schedule now to make sure that we can capture the common set of facts and all the facts associated with the costs and operational implications with the BNSF. Um, those are obviously key portions of our study. Um, so right now we're working at that, so kind of stay tuned. Um, the, the schedule will be updated uh, not too long from now. So I wanted to touch base real quick on the community outreach. We did our last big open houses. We're actually in uh, end of January in Boulder, January 31st. And then we had a February 2nd Westminster open house. And we kind of wanted to go through some of the results and what we, we heard from those meetings. So we had a, these were in-person meetings that we had. Um, collectively between the two, we had about a little less than 200 total attendees um, come to those meetings. Um, we had you know less than 30 actual comment cards filled out and return to us in those meetings themselves, but we provided <laughs> information and QR codes and really encouraged um, the participants to take the on, go to the on, on our, uh, our webpage. There was an online meeting that, that ran from just before the public open houses to about two weeks after the public open houses. And in that, we've got, we got about 33, what I would call engaged visits, 3,300, sorry, way more than 33. Uh, 3,300 uh, kind of engaged views on the website where people actually went in and started clicking around and reading information and, and uh, doing surveys and that uh, and whatnot. Uh, we'd had about 100, 100, a little less than 175 uh, completed surveys. And then, uh, um, you know, on the uh, RTD webpage itself, we had about 350 or so comments and email signups. So what did we hear? <clears throat> so right after the open houses, we sat down with our stakeholder group uh, the RTD group and our consultant team, we said, all right, so we don't have all this stuff compiled yet, but, but what do we think we heard from the, from the community? And in general, I'd say there was some optimism. I think uh, I'd say kind of a revert, reserved excitement, uh, you know, from a lot of folks that we were still continuing to look at the Northwest Rail and we were trying to move this forward. Um, we had uh, a number of uh, comments about a potential reverse commute. Uh, we had some comments about uh, potential additional stations particularly Gum Barrel and Niwot. And a lot of people were curious about what potential partnerships might look like with the uh, Front Range Passenger Rail and BNSF. Cost differential between peak service and full service was a, was a question that came up often. 
In service for customers with non-traditional commutes, maybe people in the hospitality or service industries, and, and what does this look like for them? Um, growth around the stations, uh, what, you know, what is the nature of that growth? Are there any potential stresses on the existing infrastructure? Uh, you know, what is, what is the um, existing conditions? How do they accommodate uh, stations? And then one of the big ones we heard is, you know, what are the next steps uh, if the Northwest Rail turns out to be it's determined to be infeasible uh, for, the, um, for the service. So then we took the actual comments. We took it, you know, later on, a couple of weeks later, we were able to, able to compile the actual comments that we got. And a lot of similarities, um, basically the same, same kind of general um, optimism uh, for the most part uh, for, for people on the continuation of RTD to, to, to analyze and keep studying uh, the Northwest Rail to see if we could find a solution. Uh, station areas, again, we, we got some uh, comments from several people about the additional stations, again, really at NIWAT and Gun Barrel. And then other topics that we heard, integrated uh, service options. So how does the Northwest Rail tie into uh, other existing RTD um, service as well as local service? Are there any concerns about dropping some potential service because of the Northwest Rail? Land use, again, that's primarily around station, but, um, you know, there's a lot of concern there about am I going to be pushed out of my neighborhood uh, when, when development happens around one of the stations. And then we did hear a fair amount about construction, but obviously we're in a study phase right now, so that's a little bit further down the road, but obviously if this does move into the next phase and it were to move forward, that is something we would need to be cognizant of and, uh, and accommodate. So one of the survey questions that we asked was, you know, provide us with some information about maybe why a service wouldn't work for you, a peak service wouldn't work for you. And really the comments that we got were primarily about kind of the nature of peak service itself and the, and the somewhat limited runs for peak service. So need weekend service, um, need uh, midday service and evening service and some return trips, really kind of the higher pieces. Uh, with really kind of at the bottom end, really more of the uh, the stations aren't located in a in a convenient location for us to access the service. Next, we asked what what are the benefits of the peak service uh, uh, rail plan, and I was a little bit encouraged on this one and the fact that all there's a pretty high bar on all of these items, and to me that shows that there's multiple reasons really that people would have uh, to potentially use the Northwest Rail peak service, um, and you know that. The number one that I, is probably not a shock to anybody is avoid being stuck in traffic, uh, reduce vehicle emissions right up there. Um, and it goes really from just flexibility of transportation, uh, possibly being able to relax on your, on your commute instead of driving, being stuck in your car, and then kind of rounding down towards the bottom is really uh, more of a uh, specific to individual's costs uh, to uh, driving rather than uh, using, using yeah, parking and, and uh gas and wear and tear, uh, that sort of thing on your personal vehicles. The uh, Longmont facility, uh, we did ask the question about what, what would be some, uh, some impacts and things to consider when, relo when locating a potential maintenance facility. Javier, I've said this a, a number of times, is that uh, a lot of the people that answered this question actually don't live near uh, any of the proposed uh, sites. However, um, these are all good this is all good information regardless, and it, it kind of follows along with, I think, what most people would probably expect to see. Uh, noise impacts, air quality issues, uh, traffic disruptions, really the first, first three big ones, and then kind of more towards the tail end, um, maybe not quite as critical for, for some people of visual impacts. So next steps, uh, we're going to continue to define uh, what the initial footprint looks like. Uh, what do the stations look like? Specific, you know, we're digging into a lot more detail on the stations themselves. For anybody that maybe went to the public open houses, they were at first kind of identified really as just a big rectangle uh, where a platform could be. So now we're looking at how does that circulation really work? How do we connect to it? What are the, you know, what are the trail connections? What does the parking look like? Some of the more refined details. Uh, we're also looking at the freight sightings, which is one of the important pieces that we are really pushing hard right now up front early with the BNSF to identify where those locations are. Um, we want to take that public input that we got and that we are currently still receiving on the web page um, and some pop-up events and uh, really look at how that might impact or um, inform our peak service-based configuration. 
We're going to continue to compile the draft uh, or the, the common set of facts. That's going to be something that continues throughout the entire um, the entirety of the study. And then uh, we did do an update to the Board of Directors in April. Uh, our next one, we're looking at late summer, early fall for another update to the Board of Directors. And then our public outreach right now has pivoted just a little bit because of the schedule. Uh, this summer, we're going to spend doing a lot of pop-up events. And what we want to do with some of those pop-up events is we really want to target some communities that were perhaps more historically un underrepresented. So we're looking at some cultural, uh, cultural events, um, and we really want to kind of get into um, more contact with our EJ um, communities and, and really start looking at equity. You know, folks that maybe not don't necessarily show up to the big open houses. So kind of have a little bit of an emphasis on that. We also want to show more targeted information for that specific community as well. So if it's Broomfield, we want to show the Broomfield station. If it's Longmont, we'll talk about the Longmont stations so that it's a little bit more specific uh, to, the, to the folks that are right there in that community. Um, we have, we're planning right now on uh, our next set of open houses in the fall, September, October timeframe. A lot of, the, a lot of that's going to depend a little bit on how far we get along with the BNSF on freight, uh, freight siding information, because we do want to present that to the public. Um, and just so a little bit of information on those freight sidings. Talk about there's four of them. They're about um, eight, eight, somewhere between eight and 10,000 feet long each. Um, and essentially the concept is that the, the, the freight would pull over to the side. It's probably going to sit there idling. And so obviously you can imagine that that's a fairly significant impact uh, to existing infrastructure, roadways, um, air quality, some things like that that we need to obviously be cognizant of and, and take into consideration. So, so with that, I'll uh, be happy to answer any, any questions anybody has. I'm going to let him moderate the questions. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Oh, it does work when I talk. Yeah. Um, clearly, the Boulder County. So I have a couple of questions. If you don't mind, can I ask a few? I I was very interested to see, and I think you glossed over this, um, the slide about the environmental analysis in 2010. And um, in addition to the recommendation of 11 new stations, there was a recommendation for a second track alongside the BNSF uh, freight track. Um, is that still part of the peak rail study or still part of the proposal? Very good question. I, and I should have uh, spent a little more time on that. Apologies. Um, it, is, it is not necessarily, what, there's a reason why we're looking at siding locations because we understand that it's going to be primarily a single track. And that's one of the reasons why it's, an, it's a one directional in the morning and a one direction return back in the evening is we don't have the, the bypass uh, meet points where you can actually bypass around one train, you know, the um, two, two different directions of track right now in the concept. And um, the idea of the peak service is to really provide a more modest um, concept for, for the infrastructure so that we can get the starter service and get, kind of get our foot in the door get something moving that we can expand on in the future. So we want to plan for where that double tracking will go in the future. So when we lay out where the BNSF sightings might go and where station sightings might go, hopefully at that point, it's just a matter of connecting those dots for a full double tracking. So if I hear you correctly, double tracking is not off the table. It's just not part of the peak rail proposal. It's not part of the peak rail. Yeah, which I understood it wasn't, but I, I, this is the first I've heard that double tracking is still under consideration in general. So that, that's good to hear. I hope it stays on the table. I also just wanted to mention, um, so along with uh, Director Mulvey, we're both directors uh, on the Front Range Passenger Rail District. And we have been looking at the implications of that and how can we partner with RTD, but I just want to I just want to, uh, I guess, caution uh, before we get too exuberant about all this potential that um, Front Range Passenger Rail District hasn't chosen a route, and uh, we have to go to the voters and get our, our own tax approved. So we're an, an entity, we're a body that exists, we're at the table, and we're happy to be at the table, but we've got a long way to go before we can actually start talking about that partnership in, in reality. Um, and then, uh, and uh, just to, uh, yeah. we, we have pretty regular meetings with Andy 
Tarzan, oh, sure. uh, the CDOT team. And really at this point, we're, um, as, you're, as you're aware, their uh, service development plan is not exactly tracking with ours. So they're, they're, you know, we're, we know more about, I think, what we want to do than, than they do at, at this point. Um, so right now we're just we're trying to stay on top of it. We're trying to identify what opportunities might be there. Um, we understand all that. We know that this is not necessarily a set in stone alignment for them. Um, so we are proceeding. One of the things that we need to do is determine what our needs are for running peak service with maybe without front range passenger rail there. And then we can hopefully identify what potentials might be there if we were to join join in together. Yeah, and to me, the, well, two important things about that. One is, of course, I understand you know that. Um, you know, the public, if they're seeing these presentations, needs to know that as well. But, um, but the front range passenger rail is an inner city passenger rail service may have some um, negotiating advantages with BNSF that uh, I don't know if there's it, maybe that's too many variables to try to factor into into the peak rail study. Uh, you know, BNSF wouldn't want to get deal with a hypothetical on that if if Amtrak were the service operator. But you know, there there may be some way to figure that out. But I, the last question I have is on. Um, the delay in getting the cost information from BNSF, and I, I may have missed it, but did you indicate how much that is going to delay the schedule on completion of the study? The uh, well, it's um, we're still kind of looking at that exactly. So we have the the BNSF with the way our scope is broken out. They have basically three months deliverables, and I think it's at six months, and we just just kind of kicked it off within the last month or so. Uh, got the contract and notice proceeded uh, with them squared away. Um, we'll have an initial rough order magnitude cost, but it won't be the final. Um, they're taking everything up to 30% basic engineering, and then uh, it's a year-long process for them to get to the um, what I would call kind of the final estimation of costs for the 30% basic engineering and the operations plan. So that puts it at about May of next year for the final, final numbers. But we are supposed to get some pre-30% numbers prior to that. We'll have a ROM prior to that. So we'll have information. It's just going to be revised a little bit probably as they, as they go. So I would imagine that there's going to be some clarifications and some uh, pencil sharpening that happens from, from the early ones. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's good to see Patrick. Patrick and I worked together on the Eagle project when I was at RTD that built the, uh, the B line, and so I haven't seen you in eight years. <laughs> it's good to see you again. <clears throat> and I'm going to take the opportunity to geek out just a little bit because I was intrigued when you talked about the uh, the vehicle because I was under the assumption all this time that it would just be a diesel multiple unit, and it sounded like you said there are other options you're looking at. I'm curious. Uh, what those options are, if you can talk about it just briefly, and do any of them have present any conflicts with the with the freight use or with the um, interlock into Union Station? Do they present any unique challenges that a DMU would not? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, we had a similar question for yesterday on the interoperability. Um, I, we do not do not anticipate that there's any interoperability issues. The overhead cannery system would be. Um, if we couldn't get the clearances, um, but we don't we don't anticipate that, and and really they wouldn't anticipate any differences between Front Range Passenger Rail potentially and RTD and BNSF to do that. When you get to level boarding and station sightings and the level of the platforms that are existing now, that's obviously a consideration. We are looking at level boarding high level platforms. Uh, we believe that that is the best option from a accessibility standpoint and equity standpoint and long-term functionality for RTD. Um, the uh, second part of your question, or the first part of your question, I guess I answered the second first, um, is the, the vehicle technologies. So I would say this is what the way I look at this is we're not, we don't want to eliminate anything. There's, there's a lot of technology that's developing right now, hydrogen, battery um, in particular. Those technologies may not quite be there now, so I also would say that you can't, if we were to build something today, you can't rule out diesel because I think it's it's the most proven at this stage and there's more options available. However, we don't want to say that those other technologies couldn't work for us. Um, and there are 
in particular in Europe, uh, you know, there are some test uh, trains on, on tracks. Right now there's one in California that just started up that was hydrogen or, or that's coming. It's, del- it's being delivered. Um, I think they've been delivered and they're in testing right now, if I remember right, it's a Stadler, Stadler train. Um, so those could be there, you know, at the, at the time this, this is implemented. So, again, we don't want to say that those aren't something that could happen because they could. They could. So I, hopefully that answers your question, Kevin. Good seeing you again. <laughs> Dr. Nermella. Thank you for the overview. Um, I just had a couple of questions on really your next steps. Um, one is on the design of the station. Um, are you working with the with each city to do that? Because I we, we are, we are. We're working with our with our SAT members and whoever it is that they invite to attend those coordination meetings where we present that. Um, so there a lot of times there's a lot of staff, a lot of technical staff that also sits in on it, and planning staff that kind of provides some feedback. So. Um, we, we talked to them early on to talk about kind of where the stations are located, where the platform might be, and now we're refining that. And we are talking, we are talking, we have reached out and had several meetings with, with um, all, the, all the jurisdictions to go through that. Okay. Still a work in progress. We're still working on it, um, but, but we are. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, for the common set of facts that you're developing, is that also going to integrate um, collecting data on the reverse commute potential, or just we're, we're going to look at we're going to look at that a little bit a little bit. Um, I don't know that we're going to we're not probably necessarily going to model that. I think we're really looking at those additional stations and reverse commute is really probably something that is a next stage. It's a future expansion uh, type service. Uh, we will look at it a little bit. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like just yet, but um, it, 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 it's a little problematic, I guess, on the, on the whole concept because we don't have a place to really pass the trains um, without building additional sidings and additional track. And again, trying to go back to our goal of trying to trying to keep our infrastructure impacts to a minimal while still still providing a safe and reliable, equitable service to the area. Um, we are kind of concentrating really on the peak service, three trips in, three trips out. Right, and I, I remember when you came to the city of Westminster to um, to talk to us, uh, I guess it was a few months ago, I was just um, at that time asking about looking at the flat iron flyer service and just have a better understanding of what the actual commute trends are and if this peak service into Denver is actually serving the right need because Ultimately, if we're using this peak service to get ridership, to potentially get more funding, um, I just, it, it would be good to know that this is actually something that people are going to take and use. I remember that question. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I did reach out, and I actually do have, I should uh, uh, reach, I'll reach out to you and, and provide some of that information. I did, we did ask for that afterwards to kind of get a better idea of what that ridership looks like now uh, for the flat iron flyer. But, you know, the, the way we look at too, and, and I guess in our perspective is it's really flexibility of commuting options at this point, providing some just really more mobility options in general uh, for folks to use. So we, we kind of see that it could be something that maybe somebody takes the train in in the morning and maybe they take the flat iron flyer back or vice versa. So they can use, they're not restricted to necessarily one mode. Um, so we're kind of looking at it in that in that light. And one last question: uh, Is the so we have three trips in, three trips out. If it proves to be, if we do have the ridership, is it scalable at this configuration? Could you add a couple of more, like greater frequency during those peak hour times? Frequency was something that we'd have to work with the BNSF on because um, it really has to do with. Uh, their operations as well. We have to realize, recognize that they are running a business on the corridor and they have to maintain their trains and they have to have windows for them to move goods back and forth on the, uh, on the corridor. Uh, right now we have asked them to take a look at specifically peak service, um, the three trips in, three trips out. Um, I, we can add vehicle, we can add capacity to the trains. Uh, we're looking at 400 foot long platforms. If we do it, we're look, kind of looking at a, a three car train uh, and initially, and um, that 
our platforms could accommodate additional cars on on that um, if we were to go there. So we could add passenger capacity, but anything outside of the travel windows that we're going to agree that BNSF is working on right now, um, and the number of trips during the day uh, would have to be have to go back to the BNSF, and we'd have to kind of clear that and they'd have to model it uh, and make sure it works with their operations. Okay. Dr. Multi. More geek out from Front Range Passenger Rail. One of the things that um, concerned me and led me to a lot of questions has now been elucidated, and I want to share that. The synergies in the, the grouping of information, the sharing of information, the partnership with Front Range Passenger Rail is uh, not necessarily on funding because, as Director Levy said, Front Range Passenger Rail is nowhere near that right now. But there is a, a planning committee which is working on their service development plan, and then there's a government and communications committee, which is um, is what it sounds like. The, the things that and partner that need to be partnered on is that the freight rail, if we want to a very English level, very bottom line level, if you want to reduce emissions, you have to also understand that you need to reduce truck emissions and logistics emissions. And so we have to still allow for the BNSF to have its route and for them to add track, which is that second line to increase that ridership um, over and above what they have room for, that's millions and millions of bucks per mile. And so it's not just that they have a business interest, it also feeds into our interests and our, our common policies. The stuff about um, stations is a station can be as big as what um, Colorado Springs wants to do, which is an enormous development of a public area with lots of amenities, or it can be something as little as the one I see in Lamar um, this past weekend, which is the 400 foot um, the other thing is the rolling stock, which is the actual car, those partnerships on who buys them, how they're propelled, the propulsion is how you move it. And now I'm really getting geeky, but that's the stuff that the partnerships happen on. And so I'm really happy to learn at this juncture that that's where the partnerships are happening because Northwest Rail is poised to be at a certain spot, and that may be an adequate test of whether or not Front Range Passenger Rail can even operate on these Class 1 freight lines and do so efficiently. And so lastly, the service development plan that Front Range, Rail, Front Range Passenger Rail is doing is developing purpose and need data, how people are going to use it and why. And so that feeds directly into what you're doing and a lot of the um, interactions that RTD is having now on Northwest Passenger Rail is it, they affect one another. It's a synergy. And so that's my geek out for the day. Well, thank you for that. I know that we are waiting with bated breath on some of that information from the Front Range Passenger Rail. We are just saying we, we constantly are in contact with them. We are sharing all of our information uh, with their team so that they, they know kind of where we're coming from and where we're starting from. Um, so at kind of at the end of the day, we'll have our facts from our study, and they'll have in front range passenger, we'll have their facts from their study. But we are also sitting down to look at what opportunities are there that we can identify right now that might be um, kind of some cost sharing and, and things to think about. So uh, we had a really good meeting with uh, with the um, CDOT team and uh, Andy and uh, Chrissy Bright. Um, this was uh, last Wednesday, um, and we'll, we'll keep that up. So. It's always, it's always a good conversation with them. Thank you. Any final questions before we move on? <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we move on. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Patrick. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate Great it. Great information. Thank you so much. <laughs> and not every guest speaker gets applause, so you should be happy about that. Uh, moving ahead to the overview of the statewide transportation program distribution process, this is a, a really interesting area that provides context for a lot of, of what's going on. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Alvin Fidel Sanchez, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. The floor is yours.
Chair, good evening, directors. Uh, so as introduced, um, this is a topic that we thought was timely to bring forward to y'all as CDOT begins conversations uh, with stack and that ultimately will go before the TC for uh, recommendation and consideration. Um, this is an important topic for Dr. Cog. Uh, it is one of our foundational documents that helps us set our financial plan for our regional transportation plan. So when we're talking about our fiscally constrained priorities, our list of projects, what are we funding over the next 20 to 30 years that feed into our TIP, this is one of these foundational documents that helps set those discussions. Starting with some quick basics, uh, it is part of CDOT's statewide transportation plan. And so it looks at projected revenues. It assigns those to various program areas that are defined by CDOT. Uh, it's also um, sent to the various regions that exist. So whether that's a CDOT region or a dis distribution by MPO, that's looked at over the long term. Um, it is only looking at federal and state sources that currently exist. Um, at an average economic condition. So just what do we reasonably think will be available to CDOT, to Dr. Cog, over the next 20 to 30 years to help build our transportation system and maintain it? And then like I've mentioned, we do use that to develop our own revenue forecast for our regional transportation plan that we then carry forward into our transportation improvement program. Delving into a little more on that, uh, we do have two assumptions that build our financial plan. There's an expenditure side. We know all the funding that's going to be available in the region isn't just available for projects that we want to do. Um, some of it's already called for debt service. What does it take to maintain our system? How do we keep a certain level of drivability on our roads, maintain our transit assets? The second piece is revenue assumptions. So CDOT's program distribution is one piece of that. We also do look at RTD's financial plan over the next 20 to 30 years. And then we also look at what funding is available to our local member governments. What is E470 spending on their system over the next 20 to 30 years? And so we bring all these different pieces together to figure out what revenue is available to our region for the different projects and programs that we want to complete over the next 20 to 30 years. So those two come together to create our financial plan. And that's where we start talking about fiscal constraint. What do we think is actually available to put on projects, recognizing that we can't fund every project that we want in the region. So then we start having those conversations about what are our actual investment priorities for the region? What projects do we list in our tables and our plan that are then eligible for funding through our transportation improvement program? Looking at our most recent previous program distribution that was used for our 2050 regional transportation plan, uh, CDOT did develop the 2045 program distribution using a high revenue scenario. So we carried that forward into our own plan. Um, we participated in the last process, as did the other MPOs in the state. CDOT worked with the other transportation planning regions in the state as well. And so we were able to work with them to determine what proportion, what amount is actually coming to the Dr. Cog region over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, as you'll notice, it is a 2045 program distribution, and our plan currently goes out to 2050. So one of the assumptions we did make while we were building our financial plan was to carry forward those average growth rates that we were seeing in the various program areas, the different funding types to forecast out those last five years for us to build out our financial plan. When it comes time to create our financial plan beyond just knowing what revenue is available over the next 20 to 30 years for projects, we also talk with CDOT to determine uh, within each program area, within each funding type, what is available for projects that we individually list in the plan and what is just in a bucket of funding that we know is going to be spent on sidewalks, maintenance, resurfacing, uh, transit operations. And so we do that for each of those different program areas, each funding type, and we uh, just providing some quick info of how that actually looks when you're looking at CDOT administered funds versus Dr. Cog administered funds. CDOT with their funding about 62% is allocated to what we call programmatic expenses. So those bucket of projects where we don't list individual sidewalk improvements, resurfacings, transit operations. So that is going to preserving, operating, maintaining, enhancing the existing transportation system, not going to what we call capital projects or those individual projects that if you go into our plan right now are listed uh, with a description, location, how much that cost is over the next 20 to 30 years. Since we do have more flexibility with funding that we administer as an agency, 82% of the funding that we administer goes to those individual capital projects. So that list of projects that you're seeing in the plan, um, when it is Dr. Cog administered, Dr. Cog funded, we did put a majority of our funding uh, available for those individually listed projects. So reinforcing the importance of program distribution, the different ways that we show investment in the plan from that specific project list, those project categories, investment allocations, and the narrative content. 
Um, three of these topics are how we build our financial plan, build our investment priorities, using program distribution, building it into our financial plan, and then carry it forward into our transportation improvement program. Um, rounding out the current program distribution that was used for our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, um, on your screen right now are the different program areas, the different funding types that existed when we built our financial plan back in 2020, 2021. Um, on the far right column, you'll see those percentages vary from 33% related to surface transportation to 75% surface transportation um, program metro funding. So uh, across these different program areas, different funding types, the amount that's going to the Dr. Cog region varies, just depending on what program we're discussing, what funding type we're discussing. Uh, on average, um, 30 to 38 percent of funding that is available in program distribution is coming to the Dr. Cog region. Uh, there are some discrepancies on this table, so if for some reason you all decide to add all these up after the meeting and realize there isn't a uh, one-for-one -one comparison on some of these, there are some lines missing that are representative of that discrepancy, but uh, even with that, on average, uh, 31, 38 percent of funding as a whole for the grand total is coming to the Dr. Cog region at a program distribution. So shifting uh, from program distribution into the needs, the contributions of the Dr. Cog region, one of the acronyms uh, that we use occasionally, usually during this process, but not often, is TPR, so Transportation Planning Region. Um, Dr. Cog is the Greater Denver Area TPR. So the different measures I'm about to show, the different metrics you're about to see are related to that specific geography on the map. Starting with some demographic and economic considerations, um, Dr. Cog staff like to use a general rule of thumb that we are half the state in a lot of different metrics. So these different variables bear that out. In terms of population, we're a little over half. In terms of the number of jobs in the region compared to the state, almost two-thirds are in our region. And in terms of the wages, the income that occurs in the state, uh, almost three-quarters exist in the Dr. Cog region. Shifting to travel measures. Um, again, that metric holds pretty well. About half of all trips that occur on an average day in Colorado are in our Dr. Cog region, regardless of mode uh, and regardless of whether they're coming or coming from the region, entering the region, leaving the region. Um, that carries forward into vehicle miles traveled as well, uh, whether regardless of whether you're looking at VMT on CDOT system or the whole system within the region, a little over half occurs within our Dr. Cog region planning boundary. Um, that metric does shift a little if you start looking at lane miles. Um, you're seeing 19%, 13% on this slide. Uh, one important point that we've started to have conversations with CDOT about is uh, what data are they using, what definitions are they using for this. So a concern that we've brought up with this metric is that when looking at the CDOT system, there are important facilities that are not included in this 19%, 13%. So on-ramps, auxiliary lanes are not part of this definition. So when you think about how you're traveling from I-25 to I-70, on-ramps are an important part of that travel. So uh, as we get into the conversations with CDOT, that is one concern. Um, questions that we will continue to bring up with them is just what data are they using to define that system? How are they actually determining what proportion of travel, of facilities, of uh, uh, preservation is within the Dr. Cog region? If you look at traffic fatalities, around a little under half of all fatalities that occur in the state are within our region. Uh, we bring before y'all every year different system, uh, performance targets related to safety. That number has unfortunately held true over the last couple of years. Around half of all fatalities do occur within our Dr. Cog region. And then the final metric you're seeing is transit trips. So looking at data that comes out of the uh, National Transit Database, 70% uh, of all transit trips that occur in the state occur on transit systems within the Dr. Cog region. So some important takeaways. Uh, the first one, probably not a big surprise, but the Dr. Hogg region is the economic engine for the state. Those different metrics um, bear that out in terms of population, number of jobs, the wages that are occurring in our region. If you're looking at the need, fatalities, system preservation, population, or you're looking at the contribution of Dr. Cog to the state, employment, income. Um, the rule of thumb that we are at least half the state does hold true. And an important piece, we recognize as staff that the investment in the Dr. Cog region will never be one for one. We will not get a dollar back for every dollar we put in. But as in past conversations around program distribution, as these conversations start with the MPOs at statewide MPO meetings and at STAC, uh, an important consideration staff will have is to continue to advocate for a fair share to the Denver region. 
and this is a, an important piece as they start their statewide transportation planning process is after that is considered by the TC early 2024, we are gonna begin updating our regional transportation plan, our major update that we do every four years. So this is gonna be a foundational element as we start our own financial planning process, as we determine what are the revenues that are available to us as a region, as an agency to spend on our priorities related to transportation. This will also feed into the two new transportation improvement programs that we have in the pipeline as well. So uh, regardless of whether there is a call for projects or not, carrying forward those operations and maintenance assumptions, the revenue expectations that we have into our near-term plan that's actually implementing our priorities from the RTP. That concludes my presentation, Chair. Uh, to the top store, a couple of comments. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning Operations here, Dr. Cog. Um, as I shared with the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday, I'm extremely grateful that this discussion only happens every four years. It's not a lot of fun. Um, as you can imagine, when you talk about spending scarce resources and distributing them around the state to a big and complex transportation system, uh, and the primary people at the table talking about it represent 15 very different parts of the state, 10 of which tend to be much more uh, rural and remote than the Den Denver region. Uh, those conversations get very challenging at times and no one feels like they get their fair share of resources or enough of the resources to address their transportation needs and the transportation <laughs> needs throughout the state are extremely acute. Um, at the same, and the rural parts of the state, the rural transportation planning regions will argue that, you know, they contribute a lot to the state and the state economy, and they do. And I hope what you understood today is so does the Denver region. And at some point, you know, we can't allow any region of the state and their transportation system to fail or else the whole state fails. And if you start to impact, you know, almost three quarters of the state's economic activity, um, and income and wages that contribute state uh, income tax revenue and sales tax revenue and gas tax revenue um, to the state, you start to impact the ability to invest in rural parts of the system. So I think we just wanted to ground all of you in sort of the, give you a flavor of the conversations that are ahead of us and um, how we will approach those conversations with our partners around the state and at CDOT and the Transportation Commission to talk, talk about making sure that this region does get an appropriate share of transportation dollars to invest in our system, to maintain our system. Thank you. I, I just think that perspective is so helpful. Uh, I, I just find that information uh, very uh, enlightening in terms of some of the realities that we face. Director Flynn. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, Alvin, the uh, chart on slide seven is that our uh, estimate through 2050? In other words, we're projecting through 2050, although the CDOT is only going through 2045? Uh, that's a great clarification. So um, our plan does project out to 2050. The table that is currently on your screen only shows that comparison to 2045. So uh, for both Dr. Cog total and CDOT total, it is only through 2045, just to provide an apples to apples comparison. Okay, and uh, ultimately, problem is everybody's list of things we want and need, whether we're in the Denver Metro or we're in Durango, is greater than the resources we're going to have statewide. So there's always going to be the fight. Uh, I hate to say this, at Dr. Cog, but I represent an outlying area of city and county of Denver. And I feel like the rural areas of the state, when it comes to all the resources that go into downtown Denver, versus what very little comes out to my neighborhoods. So my sympathies lie somewhat with the rural areas. I probably shouldn't say that. So have we developed internally what our goal is, what our target is, rather than the 31%? What, what do we think is fair? I think that varies as you look at the different program areas and the different funding types. Um, some of them just naturally vary based on whether there's a formula behind it related to like how our federal partners are distributing funding. Um, but then some based on just the program areas that CEO is defining, what are they defining as drivability for different preservation that they're doing on their facilities. So I think um, 
we have not set a goal of do we want a particular percentage of it, um, recognizing that will vary across the funding types, but um, 31 to 38 uh, percent, a question for us all, a question for staff, is that a fair share to the Dr. Cog region? Let me ask you then finally, are any of those line items appropriate given our level of contribution into the pot versus what we get back? Are any of those numbers correct and we wouldn't look to increase any of them? Or are they all uh, underserving us? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think if you looked at the traffic fatalities, it's 46% in, in the region that occur in the state are in the Dr. Cog region. Um, I don't know if I would argue that 49% of faster safety funds uh, is, is fair just because we're 46% of the traffic fatalities in the state. Mr. Mr. and then we'll go to Director Nermella. Oh, sorry, Elvin was exactly correct, and I, and I will just supplement a little bit to say that a lot of these formulas are very complex in the way that they've de been developed over the years, and I think right right or wrong isn't exactly right, and I think trying to set a target isn't our approach. I think our preferred approach is what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve throughout the state. And then how do we divvy up resources to best achieve those outcomes? And what, how are they appropriate for the Denver region versus other parts of the state? And how do we make sure that the system overall complements um, across, across different parts of the state? So I think it's really difficult to say, well, we should get 45% of the total resources in the Denver region. I, I could argue though on its face if we're getting about a third of the total transportation revenues that are eligible to be distributed across the state into this Denver region, but we have almost 60% of the state's population, 70% of sort of the economic activity, maybe we're a little, a little more out of kilter than we ought to be. Mr. Nermilla. Yeah, I mean, just, I was just going to point out something that, you know, in looking at this chart, you look at specific line items like strategic transit and multimodal projects, which is 39%, and yet we're the densest area and hopefully, and really likely have the most potential for transit and using transit and ridership um, development. So that, it, it's just things like that. And also what struck me, it was just the maintenance and operations being just 26%. Um, and, you know, we're very dense and we have a lot of facilities. So that, and nothing to say that, oh yes, those should definitely be raised. It's just under, um, wanting to have a better understanding of why some of those may not connect with our, with our going back to our, what our goals are. No, it's a great point. And it was a great exercise for staff as well as we looked at those different measures, um, even surprising for me personally on a num number of transit trips, for example, that are occurring within the state that are within the Dr. Cog region. So I think a very informative exercise for staff uh, and we're, also glad it's been informative for y'all as well. Alvin, thank you very much. Yes. Alvin, thank you. We will move ahead uh, to an update on RTD Zero Fare for Better Air. It's back, yay. Uh, Steve Erickson, Director of Communications and Marketing, will do our introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. I almost feel obligated to say a special warm welcome to our old friend, Bob Pfeiffer. Um, obligated to say hello and welcome, Bob Pfeiffer. Uh, I'm Steve Erickson. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director, and I'm going to work just as hard as Jacob tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the uh, Chief Communications and Engagement Officer at RTD and a good friend of ours, Stuart Summers. Good evening. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, introduction. As mentioned, my name is Stuart Summers. I'm the Chief Communications and Engagement Officer. I started at RTD about six months ago. So if you have any uh, really difficult questions to ask this evening, Mr. Brian Welch is our in-house expert, so I will just uh, delegate him to his uh, direction. Um, as mentioned, we are very excited that uh, Zero Fare for Better Air is back. And we are going to, oh, let's see if this will advance. There we go. Uh, two months, July and August. And uh, as you all know, last year we did one month, had a lot of success, saw a lot of uh, outcomes that were optimistic for RTD. Um, we were able to maintain some of the ridership that we saw. 
um, during the month of August and maintain it through the fall. And so we're excited to continue that again. Our focus for success is on changing habits and introducing people to RTD. Um, quick overview, uh, this is part of Colorado's Ozone Season Transit Grant Program. Um, zero fare will be collected across the entire system. All of RTD services are included in Zero Fare for Better Air. Um, as I mentioned, it's focused on changing habits. We want to introduce people to the system. We want to remove that barrier that may be uncomfortable for first-time users, people that are stepping aboard the train for the first time. We want to make sure it's comfortable and easy for them to access and try it out if it is their first time or they're visiting Denver or you know, visiting the area. Um, we also want to make sure we highlight the environmental impact and the benefits of, of taking transit and removing from a single occupancy vehicle. We are partnering with more than 75 community organizations, nonprofits, and groups. We've been planning, uh, we've been meeting for the last couple of months, planning out a successful two months, uh, which will include a number of events I'll jump into, um, a very comprehensive marketing campaign, really trying to make sure the word gets out about this, ex this exciting couple of months. And then the last thing I'll point out is a comprehensive survey that we'll conduct during this uh, Zero Fare initiative. We want to learn as much as we can during this. What, uh, what are riders that are using the system, customers? What, uh, are they leaving a vehicle behind? Is it their first time? Was there a barrier previously that, uh, that they've noticed that something we can address in the future? Um, is this something that they want to continue? Because after the two months, we want to make sure it is successful. Is there something that we can address when September starts to keep these individuals on our buses and trains? Um, I'll talk really quickly about some of the timeline of activities. Um, this month we started advertising, so you may have seen some billboards go up on vehicle advertising, um, a lot of earned media, the PR. Um, we have our kickoff event, which I'll touch on in just a second, that's happening tomorrow. Uh, during July and August, we'll have a number of pop-up events all around the uh, RTD district. So you'll see at different stations and platforms, uh, at bus stops, we'll just be out uh, engaging with customers and community, trying to help them understand uh, the Zero Fare initiative. Um, a lot of heavy social media promotions. We're, we're actually one, something we're doing this year that we think will be successful um, is we want to hear from customers their stories. We really want to feature this on an individual level. Why are they taking the bus or train that day? What is their experience like? And so we're trying to gather as many of these little snippets or vignettes that we can utilize. For us, that will be successful too. We want to make sure that we're able to tell those stories long after the initiative is over. And then in August, we'll start ramping things down, and that's where we'll pivot to how do we turn this into long-term behaviors and into habits that will be built uh, well beyond the two months. I mentioned our kickoff event is tomorrow. If you are around, it'll be at 10 a.m. at Denver Union Station uh, near the commuter rail platform. Um, we're very excited. Governor Polis will be giving some remarks, and we'll have a um, – Doug will be giving some remarks as well. We'll have a, a number of the big heavy hitter VIPs there, so we're excited to uh, kick off the event. Um, campaign narrative, we want to make sure that we are focused on improving air quality. That's what this grant is for, and that means moving people out of their single occupancy vehicles and using transit. We also want to show the benefits to customers. Save gas, save time, you know, have a relaxing commute, uh, sit back, you know, have time to do other things, read a book, you know, engage with other people that are on your commute with you. Uh, reduce traffic congestion, the stress that comes with that. Um, we have a partner toolkit that we have launched on our website. For any of you that uh, would be willing, um, this toolkit is, is available to all of you. Uh, it has photos and uh, suggested social media posts. It has graphics. It has videos that you can share. Um, we just launched a new How to Ride video that's available in English and Spanish, really trying to make this as easy as possible to help people help us to share this message broadly. Um, if you uh, engage with any organizations and they may be putting on an event during these two months, there's information that you can include as you're inviting people to participate in that event and how to use transit to uh, get to that event. It's all on that website and you can download it and everything's available in English and Spanish as well. Uh, we refreshed the campaign this year. Um, the top left was the imagery that we used last year. And this is, uh, the identity standards that are utilized across the state of Colorado. So we wanted to bring in some new options for some of our other transit agency partners who also utilize the Zero Fare for Better Air branding. And so we've added things like the meadow and the aspens and the mountains, really trying to freshen things up and give some different options to just catch attention in a new way. 
just a couple of things on some of the out of home, some of the billboards on vehicle advertising, um, some of the display ads, both in English and Spanish. We'll do a, a lot of uh, paid promotion throughout the, the couple of months. And then just some social media stuff that can be downloaded as well with some of this carousel is what this is called on um, Instagram. Uh, and then just to kind of round things out for service and operations, um, as I mentioned, this includes everything that RTD provides. This is all of our services, so including Accessoride. Um, we will not be adding any additional service levels during these two months. Uh, we just implemented our um, service change, and so we'll operate under that current plan for those two months. And then the last thing I'll focus on related to this before I change topics a little is just a welcoming transit environment. That is a focus of RTD right now. We want to make sure that we are open and accessible and provide a comfortable, convenient experience for all of our customers. And so we have been working for the last couple of months very diligently with all the, our municipalities and our partners to really communicate when we do the zero fare, this is a partnership and we need everybody on the same page. Um, we also have uh, staff resources. We have our unhoused uh, coordinator that goes out and does outreach, mental health clinicians. We understand that um, it's a reality. There are a lot of challenges. Whatever is happening in a community that we traverse, it will bleed onto the trains and the buses. And so we need to address that. We need to be ready to address that. Um, if you're not familiar, I'll give a plug for our RTD Transit Watch app. Um, this is a way for customers and community to engage directly with our police dispatch, share concerns, share information in real time. You can do it anonymously. You can text. You can call. You can take pictures. You can submit any information that will help us to dispatch somebody in real time. You could be sitting on a bus, you could be sitting on the 15, see something, you can text it in discreetly so you don't draw attention maybe to yourself, and our dispatch can pull up the camera on that bus and look in real time of maybe what's happening on that bus to see if we need to dispatch something. So um, the last thing I'll say about this is the Transit Watch app is really helpful because this allows us to deploy resources more effectively. We know where those issues are, we know the times of day they're happening because of the reports that come into us, so we can be a lot more effective in, in deploying those resources. And now I want to pivot to uh, the Zero Fare for Youth pilot program. We're really excited about this. So July and August will be Zero Fare for Better Air for everyone. And then starting September 1st, we will be launching Zero Fare for Youth for a one-year pilot. And so uh, we have requested from the FTA uh, permission to do this one year. Um, typically, we have uh, the ability to do a pilot for six months. We're requesting six additional months beyond that, and we are just waiting to hear back from the FTA. Um, if approved, it will start on September 1st, run for one year, and it will be zero fare for all individuals 19 and younger. Starting September 1st, it was important for us to start this with the school year. We wanted to make sure that families and individuals, as they're making their plans, could uh, could consider this as they're starting to say, how do we navigate the new school year and, and uh, you know, all the activities that come with that. Um, we are right now coordinating, uh, Brian and his team are coordinating with school districts and youth organizations and uh, church groups and the zoo and the library and all these different organizations to say, how can we partner with you to get this word out? And then also, how can we connect you with the youth of our community to uh, take transit to utilize your services or, or get to the activities of the school? Um, following this uh, pilot program, we want to evaluate its effectiveness. We'll be putting together a, a comprehensive survey, collecting data, looking at the metrics, because we want to go back and say, how do we make this permanent? And what data have we collected that we can provide this at a, at a permanent basis for the program's future? And then Steve asked me to talk a little bit about our partnerships with Dr. Cog. As you know, um, you guys are great friends of ours. And so uh, Bike to Work Day, earlier today we had um, an event, and we're excited about Bike to Work Day coming up uh, next week as well. Um, we'll be partnering at Civic Center. Um, we also work together on the Way to Go program, and we just have a great relationship with uh, the Dr. Cog team as we, we address the transit needs of this community together and the mobility options, and, and we appreciate that. We have great conversations, and, and I know Steve's team and my team are best friends and probably too good of friends because they spend a lot of time together. So. It's great, though. And with that, that's concluding my uh, presentation, and I'm happy to shift all questions to Brian. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions?
Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, I was curious how you would um, – uh, or did the tic do kids get tickets or badges with photos? Because nineteen forever, you know. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a great question. I mean, you look like you're probably going to qualify for it, if if I may. So, um, okay, I work I work in marketing, guys. Um, <laughs> No, so, so this is what we're trying to address right now. We do not want to have a barrier to anyone utilizing the system. We know we've talked about school ID. Well, what if you're 19, you're graduated, and you've lost your school ID? Or you're 13, and you lost your school ID? And so we don't want to have any of these barriers. We also recognize there may be somebody that's 18 and unhoused and doesn't have a driver's license or anything that way. So we are trying to say, how can we make this as simple as possible? And that's what we're still working out. And I can tell you, though, it will be something very streamlined, very simple, that will just say 19 and younger, get on the bus, get on the train, and let's get you where you need to go. For Mulvey. Same program, mother of somebody who's in that age range. It's go to college. Yeah. We want to encourage people to have college that's affordable. And a lot of the RTD goes to the Auraria campus and some other places. But college starts in August mm -hmm. and a lot of those people are more than 19. Mm -hmm. Is there any opportunity for that to be supported? That's a great question. Um, a couple things that come to mind. First of all, we work with the Auraria campus uh, to provide transit for their students, um, but that's something we can explore further, recognizing we'll do the zero fare for better air for those two months and hopefully we get some people, some students that are 20 or 21 that say, wow, this was a good opportunity for me and now I want to make it a long-term habit. Um, but that's something we can definitely look into as, as Brian and his team are helping us to say, how do we make this long term? The other thing I failed to mention is we know if we can get youth into the transit system, they feel comfortable at a younger age, they will be lifetime users of that system. And that's what we're focused on. Let's get them in early where it is comfortable and it's not a barrier. I have a posse of people that come from Douglas County and Westminster and Thornton that all need to go to college. And they would be very happy not to have to pay that fare. Yeah. That's good to hear. Thank you. Lecture. Included? Flex right is included in the zero fare and in the, the youth program. Yep. All services. Thank you. Have a question. Just a question. Um, are we measuring, you know, sort of before and after? And, and the reason why, I, I, Town of Superior, obviously you're measuring it. We only have like three buses that service the town always full. What we have found, and it actually this is the, you know, this free fare is actually turning people off mm -hmm. from riding the buses because the worst thing that happens is someone shows up to hit, get on the airport bus and it's full. Yeah. And then you're scrambling to find an Uber. So what we've done is we basically told everyone to stop riding the bus in August and now it's July and August. Like, how are we measuring that quit rate for, you know, what the, the, the free fares are doing? Because people want to be able to ride the bus. Yeah. But because we've lowered the cost to zero, um, there's no barrier. Yeah, I'll, I'll start an answer, and I'm going to let Brian chime in here. Um, first, for, first and foremost, because the bus one's a little bit challenging. That's why I want Brian to answer it. The train one, we are adding cars to the consist. And right, we so, have no trains. <laughs> and so you have no trains, which I recognize. But for those that, you know, the train is full, like the A-line, if you're taking that to the airport, we will be adding cars onto the consist to make it longer so that there isn't that overcrowding. For the bus one, that is, that's a topic that uh, – we heard last year, and I don't know if it was realized as much as we thought, but maybe there's pockets where it was. Do you have anything you want to say, Brian, or are you just dodging the mic? <laughs> I'm dodging. <laughs> no, the, uh, the Skyride services are very popular, and they are frequently full. That is a great question. We need, to, we need to follow up on that. I need to get more details on whether or not we have enough operators to supplement some of the, the Skyride uh, services. I mean, it's full now, right? You know, I got on it last week in a standing room only it's only going to be more full next week. And, you know, I mean, what is the last slide said? We're not adding any any additional staff, no additional capacity. So, you know, the, the message to my community is this is the worst thing ever. Yeah. Just avoid public transportation for the next two months. Well, we hope you don't say that. But, yeah, we recognize <laughs> no, no, that's, that. That's not my – that's not yeah. my yeah. – that's what everyone else is yeah. saying right now. And it's like, why did we do this as opposed to just, you know, yeah. adding the capacity? Because, again, you know, the community frustration is the flat iron flyer post-COVID is still – curtailed service and that hasn't come back and yet we're trying to encourage more people to ride public transportation we don't service 
the routes that we had prior to the pandemic. This is good feedback. We'll, we'll take this back because that's something that needs to be addressed. And we don't want that. The last thing we want during this is an unpleasant experience when somebody gets to, goes on the bus and there's no room and they're turned away. And that, that goes against everything we're trying to do. Thanks. Thank you, Director Shaw. The questions, comments? Thank you very much. You. Great presentation. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we'll move into committee reports. I'm going to insert something real quick because we never really get reports from the Regional Transportation Committee. Uh, and I wanted to briefly acknowledge the, the folks that are here that serve on that, uh, Director Shaw, Director Mulvey, Director Wheel, and Director Ward. Uh, a lot of the things we heard tonight, we heard yesterday morning, uh, and it's, it's, uh, I appreciate the effort. I appreciate you guys being there yesterday, and I appreciate you uh, still being spirited and excited as you heard some of those presentations. Yet again, thank you for your participation in that. Uh, and just one thing that we did differently at RTC yesterday is we actually acted on TAC special interest seat appointments, which is something that uh, it was, is, is out of the usual kind of or irregular, yeah, or not that frequent. Anyway, <laughs> with that, I will go to the report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The stack meant, met earlier this month. Uh, two items of note I want to share. One we've already talked a little bit about, but first, uh, HB 1101, the same bill that brought us free fares for better air, also brings us a study of uh, transportation planning uh, region boundaries, so just as exciting as free fare uh, on there, but certainly very important for, for Dr. Cog and, and really the region uh, on here. So just a reminder, uh, kind of what this will do is uh, do a study of boundaries of the transportation planning regions, uh, membership of STAC, membership of the Special Interim Transit and Rail Advisory Committee, and uh, consistency and transparency of transportation planning process across the TPRs. Uh, this is a study. Uh, the report will uh, conclude November 30th of this year uh, and go to the Transportation Commission. Any rule changes will be due before June 2024, uh, but we are lucky to have Mr. Papsdorf on the advisory committee uh, as that process moves forward. And the second uh, program distribution process, uh, Alvin did a great job, so I won't go into any much additional detail, um, but the discussions of that at STAT kick off next month. They're going to take it uh, funding source by funding source, and we'll be kicking off with the Transportation Alternatives Program, the TAP. End of report. Have to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move ahead to the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Mayor Bud Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The caucus met on June the 7th. As a, a full caucus, we had a, uh, a report on regional arts and culture. We had the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District come in. Uh, Deborah Jordy, their executive director, told us about the uh, SCFD. We're doing great work. We also had a, a presentation by the Butterfly Pavilion taking flight. They've got a great campus they're developing up in Broomfield. Uh, Patrick Quinn, the president and CEO, brought his team and told us all the great things they were doing with invertebrates in our front range. Um, after that, we talked about the, um, the caucus announced that uh, Mayor uh, Heidi Williams was going to be our new executive director starting next month. Uh, we talked about some, uh, let's see, we had uh, a presentation that we saw uh, last month, I think, at Dr. Cog here with the Civic Results Board members, uh, Rick Pilgrim and Marilee Utter, talking about corridor revitalization and how that strategy might work here in Colorado and some examples from California. We uh, then talked about sustainable, uh, affordable housing and uh, where we might uh, look to uh, review the uh, legislative actions that occurred this year in the legislature and what we might look forward to next year. And that's my report. Thank you very much. Moving ahead to the report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Commissioner Jeff Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our meeting for Friday, June 16th was canceled because a lot of people were gone, different places, and I'm going to have to step down from making the report for Metro Area County Commissioners as I've been appointed to another board um, at the state level that meets at the, exactly the same time as MAC. So um, I've talked with Commissioner Teal haven't had a chance to talk with Commissioner TV about that, but if any of the county commissioners want to do that, um, be happy to take names or 
<laughs> He's not, no. So I guess you're elected. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes my report. Moving ahead, there's no official report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. I will say that the ACA meets on Friday. And with that, we'll go ahead to uh, Executive Director Rex for the report from the Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The RAC met at its regular monthly meeting on June 2nd. Uh, two topics of uh, that I'd like to raise your attention to. Um, one was related to, we had a presentation um, from staff related to uh, emission control strategy recommendations. RAC has a control, control strategy committee, and um, they're looking at pursuing a couple of recommendations in a couple, couple of different sectors. Um, for AQCC Air Quality Control Commission consideration rulemaking. Um, the first is related to uh, lawn and garden emission control proposals. Of no, no, there's several here, but I'll just mention a couple. Is basically is the restriction and ultimately the prohibition of the sale of gas-powered push and handheld equipment in the non-attainment area. Um, also limiting government and commercial operator use of gas-powered push and handheld equipment um, later on in the, in the 20. So it's, uh, listen, this is obviously a very serious issue, and I'm sure it's a very sensitive issue as we go forth and make some recommendations on this. We're, we're in a severe non-attainment area, and it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be painful in some respects. So um, just kind of hold on tight right now. Uh, the, others related, the other sector uh, that was presented on was the oil and gas emissions control section um, of note. And I am just reading because I don't know enough about this sector to really even uh, comment. But operators within the non-attainment area must defer maintenance and other activities uh, that necessitate, necessitate equipment blowdowns to months outside the summertime ozone season. So, um, so obviously, there, we're accepting public comment. The RAC is right now. We expect there will be a lot of public comment at the next meeting in uh, early July and uh, a recommendation will be made by the council to move forward or not at that time. Um, the, the last presentation uh, was, all, was um, about 2023 severe ozone SIP development. If you recall, they had to remove a few chapters of the, uh, of this, of the state implementation plan that was submitted to EPA because there was an error in um, some of the oil and gas inventory. That is now complete, and they're going through photochemical dispersion modeling right now, and uh, staff uh, expects to have uh, those various chapters uh, begin to be available to, stat to, to the RAC members by, uh, by as early as July. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Report from the E-470 Authority, Director Moldy. Hi, yeah, uh, the E-470 um, had a foundation fundraiser and gave out over $90,000 in grants to organizations serving the communities that are belonging um, to E-470. There was also some funding for summer events in the counties and municipalities, such as fairs. Um, they're moderate amounts. There was a, a, a very comprehensive financial presentation that culminated in learning that there's an A-plus rating at S&P. The other ratings are coming in. There's no toll changes, uh, toll rate changes for the coming year, and projections uh, went out very long to account for all sorts of things, such as construction costs. Um, also, the Jewel Avenue Trail is underway and should be finished soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Darius Pakwaz from CDOT is not present. However, we are lucky enough to have a man whose name has been said more times tonight wow. than anyone else's name who works for CDOT. Bob Pfeiffer, Mr. Oh. Bob Pfeiffer. First and foremost, report. I, I appreciate the warm welcome. You, I, the team, everyone, man, I feel like a rock star. I need paparazzi. You outside. are right. Where's my limousine, my helicopter? I'm looking for this stuff. I'm only. Because <laughs> I will be back, unfortunately. I will be back. Yeah. But my day job, uh, for those that don't know, I lead up uh, uh, operations for CDOT. And I know the mayor's been up to the tunnel with me. I've given tours of what CDOT does. So I thought it was kind of cool, some of the factoids over the last year of the operational impacts to CDOT. And I thought... I could give an update since Darius is not here. I'll tell him I took his mic tonight. So last year was the highest fatalities on our highways, unfortunately. Over 760 passed away uh, on our highways. That is the highest in history. Um, we are working hard to figure out how we can change that, uh, my team as well as the engineering teams. Um, this was the second snowiest season over the last 50 years. 
Um, we had over 500 inches on Wolf Creek Pass, and we had over 400 inches over at Steamboat Springs. Um, we had crews going 24 hours a day for several months ongoing all the time. They were never stopping. Um, to give you an idea, uh, we managed 34 statewide storms, which is the highest number we've had in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, we had a 38% vacancy rate, and we've now lowered that down to 17% vacancy rate with a housing stipend. We've introduced housing along the I-70 corridor where we actually build workforce housing. Uh, we broke ground in Frisco uh, a few weeks ago, and we're going to do Fair Play next. And then we have, a, uh, we have about another half dozen places we're going to do it as well. And basically, we give the keys to anyone who wants to come and snowplow. Um, or if you don't, we give up to $2,000 housing stipend uh, for employees that are on the corridor. Uh, that has obviously closed uh, the gap. In fact, starting uh, next week, our frontline begin entry-level positions will start without housing stipend at $62,000 a year. So you don't have to know anything, and we'll pay you $62,000 to come and learn it. Um, we, we snowplowed 6.5 million miles last year. That was uh, 261 times around the earth uh, here in Colorado. Uh, my team does the avalanche mitigation. So we had 488 uh, missions and 203 hit the road, which in our eyes means 203 lives probably were saved. Um, we had a 15% increase in uh, Incidents over the winter, which was over 12,000 incidents just in the metro area, and we would call incidents like traffic accidents and so forth, had an increase in that, but we had a decrease in closures on our highways. We had a 9% uh, uh, down. So it just showed with a high vacancy, high incidence, we still lowered closures, and we still plowed. And so I have to say there's a bunch of unicorns I work around, and I'm very proud of them. Um, we uh, trained over 200 people that did not have CDLs to close that gap, and we trained uh, all of them in-house and got them out there. In fact, uh, we have about a 95% success rate that they retained with uh, CDOT. Uh, let's see, we trained over 15 howitzer crews. My team does the artillery. I don't know if you all know that, but we do shoot artillery. Um, that will be sunsetting, so if you want to come and see what we do, we'll, I'll take you, take you on. Uh, here, here's something that I wanted to really bring up is the money. I mean, we always talk about money, right? And uh, out of our maintenance budget, um, over 100 million, it's about 287 million. We had two injections. We had a $12 million injection and a $19.6 million injection, uh, specifically for snow and ice. That brought out of the roughly 300 and let's just say $10 million rough estimate, uh, over 100 million, so a third, was just to do snow plowing and ice removal. That was it of the entire budget for the state, uh, for CDOT. So, um, the other portion was traffic, uh, striping, lights, you know, that, that kind of stuff's been uh, Denver, right? Denver takes a lot of that. Uh, not Denver City, but Dr. Cog area. Um, so the snow and ice has been a big topic, and you don't realize how much it consumes material. Everything else has gone up, as we all know, in our communities. And uh, that's probably good enough, but I thought that was some good factoids over the last year, and uh, it's amazing uh, what CDOT does, and it's, I think I did a better report than Darius, and I'll tell him. <laughs> Bob Pfeiffer, everybody. Oh, thanks, Bob Pfeiffer. I'll be back next month. One, one last thing. I just want to say thanks to the staff. I mean, you guys are awesome. I appreciate everything you all do. So I just, well, I had the mic. I didn't want to do it at the end because we need to get out of here. So, and thanks for everyone. Report from RTV, Brian Welch. Thank you, Chair and Directors. We have opened up our Call for Projects partnership program, so all you stakeholders out there, come to RTD with your innovative mobility ideas. Uh, we have funding this year, and we're looking forward to working with you on that. We're about to begin a zero emission bus fleet and facilities plan, which is very ambitious for an agency like ours that has 1,000 buses. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, two last things. We, the Board of Directors will be considering the Code of Conduct on June 27th. Stuart Summers mentioned our welcoming transit environment. And finally, on July 11th, our fair study and equity analysis is for the Board of Directors, and we're looking at greatly simplifying our fares and lowering our fares. That's what I have tonight. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As mentioned, the work session uh, July 5th has been canceled, so our next meeting is July 19th. That's the Board uh, session. Do you have some of that?
I guess in other matters. Okay. And now other matters by members or executive directors. Uh, thank you very much. I, three items. Uh, first, I would like to welcome back uh, Director Director Cheryl Wink from Inglewood. It's been a while since you've been here, so good to see you again welcome. for you for sure. Uh, also, if so, okay, to get access to the building, so the parking garage, these doors will not be open tonight. It was deemed a security risk. So as a result, in order to get to there, to the bottom of the escalator, go through this door right here and hang a left. And there's a hallway that'll take you right back out there, okay? Um, Ooh, and we have tour guides to help with that. Well, I know, I was just wondering about that. And then also, um, there's, a, there's a good little storm that's coming our way right now. So you might wanna check your phones on the way out, depending on which direction you're heading. You might wanna hang tight for a little bit, just FYI. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other matters by members? Thank you to the board. Appreciate everything you do, and thank you to staff for all you do. Have a good night. Yeah.